Well, good evening and welcome to University Presbyterian Church. Uh, it's a great gathering. We're so glad that you're here for this forum entitled Wrestling with Reconciliation. And uh, it's great to see you all. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to invite our senior pastor, George Hinman, up to just greet you and uh, welcome you himself. Thank you, Ken. I also just want to say thank you for coming. We're trying to do more here at UPC for adults. We've got a lot going on if you're a kid or college student or um, um, something else. But here you are, you're an adult. And uh, we want to grow in our discipleship as well. And so your being here tonight is a commitment on your part to grow in your faith. And we appreciate that. So thanks for coming. These uh, events are, are continuing on in various shapes and form different topics uh, throughout the spring on Wednesday night. So keep an eye out for other opportunities to come. Also, I want to say thank you to you and those who are going to present tonight. Um, this topic is so hugely important. I was in a conversation today with some of our staff around the changing complexion of our city and the changing complexion of our church. And I got to say, it is so welcome um, to see changing faces, different ethnicities that are coming and calling UPC home. It's such a privilege and an honor. But it's hard work, and um, we're just getting started with that work. We have a long ways to go. We've got a lot to learn, all of us. And so um, tonight's a part of that. Uh, anybody who's reading the news, whether it's U.S. or Europe, knows that um, the culture doesn't typically deal with this issue real well all the time. So I'm thankful that Jesus prays for his church, and he prays for one church of many nations. And my prayer is that we could here at UPC model a little bit, and other churches uh, together with us here in Seattle model a little bit what it looks like to give a taste of heaven here on earth of every tribe and tongue, people and nation worshiping Jesus Christ together. So thanks for coming, and uh, thank you for hosting, Ken. Thanks. Thanks, George. Um, well, uh, we have been given a gift this evening. Um, you know, it's important. Uh, this is an important conversation at a really important time. It's important that you showed up this evening because by showing up this evening, you're acknowledging that there's, a bro there's brokenness uh, in our society and that you want to engage that. And uh, we have been given a gift this evening. We have the opportunity to take really the most probably the most appropriate stance that many of us can take at this time, and that is to listen. And so we have some folks that have come and they're gonna share uh, their story uh, tonight and share about a much bigger context in which uh, Ferguson and Staten Island and uh, Florida and Tamir and all these horrific uh, realities have happened in our world and in our society. There's a bigger context. And we're going to engage that over these next three weeks. Tonight, uh, we're going to work with uh, the, the uh, ideas around uh, how media informs race formation and identity. And then in subsequent weeks, we're going to work with uh, economics and segregation. Uh, and then in the final week, we're going to work with uh, reconciliation and the Christian community. It's going to be a phenomenal series. And it's a gift that's being given to us by our friends, our brothers and sisters at Urban Impact. And Urban Impact is a Christian community development movement in South Seattle. And uh, it's an amazing uh, ministry. It's an amazing community. It's an amazing organization. We're going to have opportunity to learn more about uh, our friends and uh, the ministry of Urban Impact as well tonight. But I'm going to get out of the way, and uh, I'm going to introduce you to Drea Chicas, who is uh, Urban Impact's community organizer and youth development uh, coordinator. And uh, she uh, is involved at Rainier Avenue Church in South Seattle. She works predominantly in Hillman City uh, and the surrounding neighborhoods. And uh, she's going to be our host tonight. She's going to kick us off, uh, frame, the, frame the evening for us, and uh, lead us out. So, Drea, come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, as Pastor Ken said, I am Drea, um, and that is actually the best introduction that I've ever had in my entire life, so thank you. Uh, we're making history here. 
Um, I am so excited to be here with you tonight, particularly because um, I am no stranger to wrestling with reconciliation. Um, personally, my brother is a professional boxer, and so I am still getting used to the idea of seeing him fight in a ring, because I, I just don't understand how um, beating each other up is a sport and an art. But I am learning, and what I'm learning is that um, boxing is more than just punching and getting bruises, but it really is a gathering, a meeting of two people um, who come together um, and, and you know, work for an outcome. Um, and so when I think about um, the Word of God and when I think about um, Paul in particular, he really um, describes the faith as something to fight for, right? When he describes the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. Um, so I believe that tonight we are wrestling with something that God is calling us to wrestle, and in particular, the church. So I want to um, definitely thank you for coming out here um, and, and being present um, to, to the outcome of tonight and what God has in store for us. Um, I have the privilege of introducing to you um, Pastor Harvey Drake. Um, he is the pastor of Emerald City Bible Fellowship, a vibrant multiracial church in Seattle, Washington, that's committed to making the gospel relevant to every facet of a person's life. He is also the founder and the president of Urban Impact, which was formerly known as Emerald City Outreach Ministries a thriving community-based organization that is proactively addressing the total needs of families in Seattle's Rainier Valley. Ordained in 1979, Reverend Drake has worked extensively with youth serving as area director for both Youth for Christ in Oakland, California, and Young Life in Seattle, Washington. And since 1987, Reverend Drake has been devoted to addressing urban and inner city issues through urban impact. Um, and so what I love about Pastor Harvey Drake is that he can come into a room and just disarm you with his humor, so be careful. Um, but really it is, what I most admire about Pastor Harvey is his passion and his willingness to continue to wrestle and fight um, for in the investment of leaders, particularly in Rainier Valley, um, and he's really made this his life, lifetime calling and lifetime work. And so it is a blessing to hear from him. Um, I do want to let you know that this session will be recorded and available online through Urban Impact's YouTube site. Um, so without waiting any longer, please welcome Pastor Harvey. Well, good evening. Wow. Uh, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to uh, be invited. I want to first give honor to God because he is the head of my life. And uh, uh, Pastor Hinman, thank you for being here tonight and for inviting me. And Pastor Ken and I go back a long way. We are old boxing buddies. <laughs> we were on the same side, though. And uh, so it's... <laughs> I, I know that line. That came from which movie? <laughs> It's good to be here. I feel like I need to do a little urban renewal because everybody's sitting in the back, so uh, I'm going to call a few names out and invite you up to first class. First class. Please uh, come, come up to first class, please, would you please? But uh, if, you're, if you're more comfortable where you are, then just stay there. Uh, we're, we're excited. I don't know about you, but uh, we, we are living in some pretty volatile times right now. And uh, a number of things have happened recently that's heightening, if you will, the concern around how we interact with each other. And so I've been wrestling with, in all of the racial tension and melee that's been happening, how should we as believers respond to this? And I've been trying to be careful uh, to, to monitor whether or not I am responding like the average person who may not necessarily have a commitment to Christ or an understanding of what God uh, purposes for us, or am I trying to respond in a way that is more in line with what God is doing? For instance, uh, this Saturday we're going to be uh, having a, a, a peace march, if you will, from our church in Rainier Valley down to a local uh, donut shop. 
Uh, I don't know if you heard it in the news, but a Cambodian family has been in our community for years. I have a wonderful donut shop. They sell teriyaki, and you can wash your clothes at the same time. I always hope they're not getting suds in the donut mix, you know. But uh, they were robbed recently and beat up fairly badly. And it's really, tr it's really tra tragic that something like that happens. So we're marching from our church down to that particular shop. And along the way, we're stopping and we're speaking peace over our neighborhood. We're going to be singing along the way. We're going to stop and we're going to pray prayers for the neighborhood, for the community, for the businesses there, for the civic government that's there as well. Because we believe that we, it's okay to march, but we need to march with a different purpose and one that leads people in a different direction. So uh, if, you're, if you're free, Saturday, 9 a.m., Drea has organized this uh, march for us. It's not going to be a very long march, but it's going to be a very meaningful march because we, we intend to do something that's going to change the landscape of what's happening in our part of Seattle. Is that all right? Thank you. It's, 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 it's okay to say amen every now and then. In fact, that might help me. I, I preach a little better when uh, people say, "Amen, preach, preacher." Okay, well, let's let's get let's get started here. Let me let me start by reading a passage of scripture. This Ephesian text here, Ephesians chapter two, starting with verse eleven. And it reads as following, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the human body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh, his body, the law with his commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. That's the word of the Lord. Now I wanted to start there because I think it's important that we remember that we remember that God has a plan and a purpose for each of us and a plan and a purpose for his church. And he desires that his will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And guess who he's looking forward to helping that happen? You and I. So tonight we want to talk about a number of things. We're going to wrestle a bit. We're going to talk about the influence of media on image and identity formation. I don't know about you, but uh, I have a pair of shades. They're old shades. They don't, they don't change with the sun. They stay one color. And they are a single color. So when I put those shades on, everything I see is colored by those shades. Huh? And I look at you and those of you who seem to be a little pinkish, as they would say in South Africa, you tend to look a little greenish. And then people who look like chocolate brown folk, according to what they call us in South Africa, uh, I don't know what color you guys start looking. But you look differently because of the color of the lens that I look through. And in life, we all have a lens through which we see each other. We all have images of each other that have been formed somehow by what we've either seen, have been shown, or what we've heard. And so tonight we're going to talk about this media thing, okay? So this is how we're going to look at it. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to be very honest and if you want to talk amongst yourselves, you can do that, or you can just talk to yourself. But I'm going to show you a series of photos. And when I show you the photo, I would like for you to just, if you want, you, 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 you have a, a sheet of paper there. You can write down what comes to mind. Let's put up the first photo, please. This is a photo of what type of person? What ethnicity? Looks Native American, doesn't it? Okay. Let's uh, switch to the next photo. Should be a series of photos of Native uh, people, amen? When you think about Native Americans, what comes to your mind? What images do you see? What do you understand about that particular group of people as it relates to uh, who they are here in America? 
Just think about it. You can write some of those things down or just record them in your heart. Let's go to the next photo. Ah, a group of cute little children, huh? Uh, we, we all understand them to be Asians. Amen? Next slide. Ah, another group of Asians. Next slide. Another group of Asians. So, so what comes to mind when you see that group of people? What have you learned about them? What have you been told about them? What do you understand about them? What is the baseline image that you have of them? I could fill in the blanks for you. Some would say uh, they're, they're very smart. They're very family oriented. Some would call them the silent minority as it relates to here in America. And we can have any number of images or ideas about them based on what we have seen, how they've been portrayed or what we've been taught. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, oh, there's some cute little ladies there, huh? All right. Hey. Look like a bunch of foxy sisters to me. I don't know what comes to your mind. Well, they, they, there's some hot mama jamas right there, right? African Americans. Okay, next slide. A couple more African Americans. Again, based on what you have experienced, what you've been told, what you've been shown, what images come to mind? What do you know about this particular group? And don't, don't, don't tell me what you know about Oprah. Because you know, Oprah's an exception. She's a billionaire, okay? She's a little different than I am, you know. She got lots of money. But, but think about what it is we understand about each other. Let's go to the next slide. Ah, uh, this should be very familiar. Especially here in America, right? Because America is still predominantly Caucasian, or, or when I really want to sound professorial, Caucasoid. Next slide, please. Nice, happy family. All right? Nice, happy family. Again, what, what do we understand about this people group? I won't tell you what they told me when I was growing up. That there are a lot of people in this group that I was not supposed to trust. That could not be trusted. Who were grabbers and takers and you, you name it. There are lots and lots of images that come to mind, right? Next, next slide, please. Hispanic gentleman. Got the union in the back, justice. He's fighting for something. Next slide, please. Again, I have to ask you the same question. What do we understand about this people group? And what you understand about the people group comes from where? What has informed your vision or image of this group? Let's go to the next, next slide. <clears throat> Next couple of slides are pretty, pretty interesting. Let's go to the next one, please. <clears throat> Biracial individuals. When I first moved to Seattle about 30, a little over 30 years ago now, um, I was really surprised at the number of interracial couples there were in Seattle. I came from San Francisco, and we, we have a hodgepodge of people there, but never saw the kind of interaction there that I saw here. And increasingly, we're seeing more and more people who cross color lines and social lines and economic lines to marry one another. And so these individuals represent biracial. What do we understand about them? So as we, as we pause here for a minute, I want to stress this one thing, is that when you watch television, I want you to pay a little closer attention to who's on the screen. I want you to pay attention when you watch uh, network news, who's on the screen. When you watch cable news, some of you have graduated from, from uh, channel 7 and 5 and 4, and now you're on 44 and 51, you're, you're cable, you CNN, you're, in, in, you know, you're Fox News and the whole nine. But watch who's on the news and what it is they are doing. Have you ever noticed that Channel 13, I noticed this, is, and I don't know why I watch them anymore. It's the only, only broadcast station in Seattle that do not have people of color on their team. 
Channel 4 has people of color. Channel 5 has people of color. Channel 7. But 13 has no people of color. I thought, what? what's up with this? And I used to like, like them a lot. But I noticed that there, there are no people of color on that broadcast team. And I'm trying to figure out why not. In a place that's as culturally diverse as Seattle, why would that station not have people of color on their team? Okay, so we've got something else I need you to do real quick. Now, this is a test. You guys love tests, right? We're going to do, we're going to do a, what I call your racial IQ test. Now, if you never heard of it, there's a book out there called Don't Believe the Hype, written by a reporter. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Faria Chidia. I hope I'm pronouncing the last name correct. I've never met her in person, so I'm just assuming. But she did a study <clears throat> to look for how people are portrayed in public places. And so she did all this research and printed it, published it, and it's a great, great piece of work. And it's called Do Not Believe the Hype. And what she was trying to do is dispel the myths that we carry about each other. I don't know about you, but I do have stereotypes. And I do see people a certain way. And I'm trying to overcome some of that. So let's, let's do this. So what would you say was the first... Slide, please. Which state was the first to abolish slavery and in what year? Somebody said what? Okay, others? Anybody else want to venture a guess? Somebody said A? How many would say A? Raise your hand. How many would say B? Raise your hand. How many would say C? Raise your hand. How many would say D? Uh huh. You follow my trick, huh? The answer is C. Vermont was the first one in, in 1777. Next slide. How many HBCUs are there in the United States? Historically black colleges and universities. How many universities do we have in Washington State? Does anybody know? How many black historically colleges and universities do we have in Washington State? Somebody say zero. Okay. Well, what about across the U.S.? Any, any, anybody know? Across the U.S.? Nine. Ten. Somebody say 25. Raise your hand. Somebody say at least 50. Raise your hand. Who says 100? Raise both hands. Okay. In the United States, there are 106 historically black colleges and universities. And guess where they are? All east, of the, all east of the Mississippi. And most of them are in the Confederate States. I learned that uh, probably ooh, 30 years or so when I read the book, Even the Rat Was White. It was a book on black psychology. And, and, and growing up, I never knew there were that many historically black colleges and universities. Quite a few. And it's interesting to note that, that, uh, that they say 5% of Af African Americans that attend college graduate, and 95 of the 5% graduate from historically black colleges and universities, which means that the UWs and the WSUs of the world uh, are not graduating black folk very, very much. How many of you are aware of the fact that there are what they call um, HSIs here in America? HSIs, that's a Hispanic Serving Institution. It's, an, it's a college that is given special money to help educate uh, Latin people. Ever, ever heard of that? HSIs. Federal program designed to assist colleges or universities in the U.S. that attempt to assist first-generation, majority, low-income Hispanic students. A lot of stuff we just don't know. Is that right? Okay, uh, next, next slide. What percentage of, of America drug users are black and what percentage are white? How many at this point would say A? How many would say D? 
Okay, how many would say C? How many want to go with B? Okay, the correct answer there is D. The truth of the matter is there are more uh, Caucasian people on drugs or take drugs or use drugs than black folks. Some would argue it's because of the percentage numbers, the percentages, right? But the perception is what, generally? And when you see images of people on drugs and drugged out, they're generally who? Okay, you don't see as many white people. Have you ever seen any Asian people drugged out on TV? Yeah, we, we, we get the rolls on TV, but we're all hung over. We have no lines. Well, Denzel has changed all that, so that's not true. <laughs> Carrie Washington, she's changing all that, so that's, that's not true anymore. But the reality is, is that the image that's portrayed is that the majority of people on drugs are people of color, black and Hispanic, and primarily. Let's go to the next, next slide. So what percentage of the U.S. government budget goes to welfare and social security? How many would say A? How many would say B? Well, you guys are getting scared now. <laughs> how many would say C? Okay, how many would say D? But the reality is, is that the answer is D. Less than 1% of our budget goes to welfare and 20% to Social Security. Now, the reason I, the reason I mention this is that if you listen to uh, media, most of us in the middle class are told that we're squeezed out of our hard-earned dollars because we have to take care of all these poor people. And I don't know about you, but I still, if I'm not careful, get an attitude when I see somebody coming through lines with food stamps. Because if I'm out working, then surely they ought to be able to work too. Amen? And they, but the image is that the majority of people uh, in this country are draining us because we have to take care of all of them. And the reality is also, and I, I didn't put it here, is that there are technically more white people on welfare than there are black people. And we rarely have ever talk about corporate welfare. How many of you were around when they bailed out the big banks? Bailed out the big three, the auto dealers. How many of you consider that welfare? No, we're just helping our economy. But it's how things are framed. Is this making sense at all? It's, it's about how things are framed. And it's really sad because of the way things are portrayed that we would think that our hard-earned tax dollars are going to take care of the poor when in reality, 1.4% of our budget is used to care for those we consider poor. Okay, let's go to the next slide and we'll move on to something else. So in a phenomenon called tipping, white residents of a neighborhood tend to move out of their neighborhood when a certain percentage of their neighbors are black. What percentage of black neighbors cause white flight? Let's see, how many would say A, 20%? That seems like a reasonable number, right? What about B, 15%, okay? Got a brave soul over there. How about C? Okay, how about D? Okay, the correct answer is C. It is believed that based on some history that when a community became 8%, black folk would start moving out. It's called white flight. And then when you have a person like me and or Drea who uh, begin to move into the middle class, if you will, then you experience what they call black flight because I want what everybody else has. And so I begin to go where, you know, the, the, the services are, the taxes might be a little lower, the schools are a little better, and so we begin to move out as well. In fact, in fact, the downside of integration is this. The downside of integration is that when we started integration, uh, those who were role models in poor communities began to leave, and we lost a lot of our role models. Before integration, our doctors lived with us, our dentists lived with us, our coaches lived with us, our educators lived in the same neighborhood as we did. Integration came and some of us took flight 
and had the capacity to move. In fact, my wife and I were somewhat guilty of that. When our boys got to high school, uh, there was an insistence on one of us that our boys go to private school. My wife grew up in private school until she got to high school, then her parents let her go to a public school. Um, and we, we fought a good portion of that summer before my oldest son started his private school education. And what I remember is saying to my wife in this discussion is that if we put our kids in these schools, we're going to have to scrimp and scrape and it's going to be tight, but we have to be committed to our local school as well. Because there are kids in our schools that need to see fathers, number one, involved in their lives. Number two, involved in their schools. And somebody who will walk down the hall and say, boy, pull, you up, pull up your britches. Or walk down the hall and say, man, how you doing today? Put your arm around them and affirm them. But integration kind of hurts that quite a bit. So, one, one, a couple more here. Let's go. True or false? TV announcers use terms like smart and cerebral to describe white athletes more than black athletes. Yeah, for, for, for years, I mean, Russell, Russell Wilson is our man, am I right? I'm so glad he's black. Woo, Russell, Russell, Russell. Russell, uh, the, one of our piano players at our church is a, is a white woman. She teaches uh, first grade. And uh, so because her, her last name is Wilson, and his last name was Wilson. A little boy came up and said, are you Russell Wilson's mother? Is he your son? And she would go, yes. <laughs> Third grader came over and said, uh-uh, you guys don't look alike. And she said, well, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of kids who have parents that look different from them. Then a little smarter third, grade, uh, great third grader came up to her and said, so do you go to all of his games? And she said, no, I don't. She said, you're not his mother because my mother goes to all my games. <laughs> But we're, we're excited about Russell because Russell's breaking the stereotype and a whole bunch of others out there are starting, they start realizing that brothers, brothers can play quarterback. We have the, the acumen to do that. For a while, they didn't think we could do anything but block, maybe run and, and catch a little bit. But we, we, can, we can manage that thinking position. And what happens is because of the way things are, are taught, uh, TV announcers use terms like smart and cere cerebral to describe white athletes. And th this is the, the answer to it. True or false? It's true. Let me not, let me not huddle there because I got something else I want to say. So, so what percentage of the 18,000 Americans employed as a professional athlete of some type are African Americans? A, B, uh -huh. C, K, and D. Okay. The, the answer is C. Now, the, the, the way things are portrayed, because we <clears throat> probably watch more, we watch more, <clears throat> let's face it, more basketball than we do hockey on television, right? We're starting to catch up with tennis, but come on, who wants to watch it late night, right? And so the, 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 the sense is that sports are primarily dominated by African Americans. But when you put all the sports together, that includes lacrosse. That includes, uh, how is curling a sport? <laughs> uh, you know, curling and, you know, when you put all of them together, the percentage goes way down. Now, true, true, uh, the preponderance of basketball players happen to be men of my hue. Okay, there are, a few, there are a few Larry Birds out there, and they're trying to hold on to Nowitzki and those guys, man. You know what I mean? And, the, and there are 350 uh, pro basketball players out there, majority of whom, 80%, are African Americans. Football is another sport where we tend to have a little more, a little more dominance in terms of numbers, right? Um, uh, baseball used to be ours in the, in the era of Willie Mays and Willie McCovey, uh, uh, but now it's, it, it belongs to Pedro. <laughs> Pedro and Suzuki is now dominate, becoming dominated by black Hispanics and Asian with white. 
shifting. But if you, if you aren't careful, you get the impression that we dominate all of that. So here, here are a few other facts for you right here. Uh, the NFL, National Football League, National Basketball Association, and Major League ba Baseball, there are 32 teams. Only four of them have African-American coaches. Baseball, there are 30 teams. Only five of the skippers or managers are African-American. All right? Now think about that as it relates to football and basketball. Because let, let's face it, we are, we're there, we are there in good numbers. NBA, 30 teams, they do the best job. They have 10, 10 coaches. Now the, the big number, 240, uh, represents 240 coaches in baseball that are not managers and skippers. They're the guys that coach first base and second base or third base, and they're the batting coaches, et cetera. 240 of them, and only 37 are African American. So, let me do one other thing, and then I'm going to try to bring some conclusions here. So, recently I noticed this. Two things happened. Right after Ferguson took place, uh, Michael Brown uh, was unarmed and was killed. Here in Washington State, uh, there were two separate incidences whereas, where, whereby white men shot and wounded police officers and were taken alive. One of them uh, uh, was, was shooting at a Catholic church, I think it was, to start with bean bags. They called 911, the police came, and so they did a little chase. And then they shot the guy, and he got in his car, and they chased him a little bit. And so they finally got him to stop because they threw down tax strips, and his tires burst, and he crashed. He gets out of the car, and guess what? They shoot him with bean bags. I didn't even know police use bean bags. Bean bags did not stop him. So they shot him finally with rubber bullets, took him to jail, patched him up, and questioned him. And I kept asking myself, how is it that, how is it that a black guy who's unarmed winds up dead, and a white guy who shoots and wounds an officer is still alive? Something has to change in how we view each other. I'm not mad, bro. But, 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 I, but I have to point that out to you, that there's some inconsistencies that need to be dealt with. So what i like to do is this. I want us to, I think I handed, you should have gotten something that looks like, looks like, did I, did I leave it down there? Yeah. Let me grab that. Yeah, let me go. You should have gotten something that looks, actually there's one that should be a three, three pager that I need. Okay, you should have gotten something that looked like this. It says white suspects and black victims. Thank you. Thank you. What I want to do is put, put my next slide up. Uh, go, go, go past that one because I'm running out of time. I want you to see firsthand, these are, these are real headlines, how we communicate about each other as it pertains to issues. So this is the guy who shot at the theater in Colorado. So what does it say? Theater shooting suspect was what? Brilliant science student. Remember, he shot this place up and killed multiple people. This is Michael Brown. Michael Brown struggled with officer before shooting. And if you continue to read the article or if you continue to listen to the news, all sorts of negative things came out about this particular person. Okay, rather than focusing on the fact that he was unarmed, most of the attention went to, oh, boy, but he was this, and he took some cigar cigarellos from down here, and he did that. Well, this guy killed, killed folk. And then you see how they talk about him. Okay, so you, ha you have this, right? So this document says, Alabama suspect is brilliant, but social misfit. That's how they presented the story of Amy Bishop, a former college professor who eventually pled guilty to killing three colleagues and wounding three others at a faculty meeting in 2010. Interesting how she is portrayed. Black victim, Montgomery's latest homicide victim, had a history of narcotics abuse, 
tangles with law. Now, he, now he's dead, right? The other woman did the killing. Let's read the next one. White suspect, son in Staten Island murders, was brilliant, athletic, but his demons were the death of parents. And so this is how Staten Island Advance covered the case of Eric Bellucci, a mentally ill New York man who allegedly killed his parents. Trayvon Martin was suspended three times from school. Remember, Trayvon was the guy that we really got upset about before Ferguson, right? So we, we, could, we could labor this longer, but we won't. My point here is this, is that the way we perceive each other can be grossly colored by what we're told and how we are portrayed. And so you, you, you hopefully will understand why some people get really upset at how the media portrays certain people and why people would say that there's bias in the overall system. Okay, let me, let me wrap this up because we want to have an opportunity for some of you to ask a few questions here. The sources of information that we get about each other comes from family, friends, come from movies, come from news, come from uh, print media, and primarily the lack of personal relationships. I told you I was taught and raised not to trust white men because they, they could never be trusted. That was, that's how I was taught in my family, okay? Uh, we, we always see, we're starting, uh, when, when Bill Cosby in the 80s, 90s came out with the Cosby family, a lot of folks didn't want to carry the show. They said that was unrealistic. A father who's a doctor, a mother who's a lawyer, you know what I mean? They didn't, no, that's not a real man. You got to get the guy who's down and out. And Good Times was, I don't know if, if some of you are old enough to remember. No, you probably didn't watch Good Times. But, you know, he, he was broke, lived in a pu public tenement, poor. And they said, oh, that's the real image of a black family. Again, movies and broadcast news and print media. Those are the sources. So let me, let, me, let me throw out a few things that I think will help us deconstruct our racial biases. I have them as well as you. So I know what I think about most of you and most other groups. I have my stereotypes. So it's going to be real easy. I want us to start by educating ourselves. One of the reasons that uh, I like Ken so much is that Ken and I spend a fair amount of time together, just talking, having breakfast together. He does the coffee thing, I do the water thing. He does the beer thing, I do the water thing. <laughs> He's drinking a little wine, I'm doing the water thing. I know, I'm boring. But we spend time together and we talk. And he probably knows some of my idiosyncrasies and I know some of his. You know, I, know, I know where he's weird. And, and believe me, he's off in a lot of areas, but I still hang out with him anyhow. <laughs> but it's personal, this personal relationship. But we've taken time to educate ourselves uh, about each other. We, we develop personal relationships crossing those crazy lines. But how many of us actually take time to learn about other people, their history, who they are, what they do, how they do? Another way to deconstruct our racial bias is to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Most of us don't want to have conversations around race because they are uncomfortable. And quite frankly, as an African-American man, man, I get tired of having the conversations. I don't want to talk to another white person about Ferguson. How many calls have I gotten, Pastor George, not from you, but people who want to have coffee with me? I just want to know how you're feeling. What are you thinking? What, what's your vantage point? What's your perspective? I don't have one. Because I'm tired of talking to white folk about stuff. But the reality is, we've got to become comfortable with being uncomfortable if we ever plan to make ground. Can somebody say amen? That's a good place for it. We need to engage in, engage in courageous conversation about race in class. And that is, sometimes the conversations could be very difficult to have. 
but we need to start having courageous conversations. Now, I'm having some conversations in two worlds. I'm having conversations in the world uh, that I hang out with where my friends are not African American, and I'm having some very hard conversations with some of my friends who are African American, because after we finish, finish marching and riding over Ferguson and New York, we got some stuff to take care of at home. but courageous conversations. And I believe that the people of God are to be the people who have the most courageous conversations anywhere because we have a vantage point that's very different from those that don't necessarily have the word of God to inform them. Okay, speak up and speak out against racial bias. I, my, my sons, um, I'm, t- I'm 28 years older than my youngest son. My father's 28 years older than I am. Now, I remember one, one, one day specifically, I picked my sons up from junior high school, middle school, and they get in the car and they start mimicking Asian people. And they start making sounds that they thought were Asian. And I can remember slamming on my brakes, and I turn around, what are you doing? How dare you make fun of somebody else? Don't you know that black people have always been made fun of? And I, boy, I ripped them up one side, down the other. They were up in the windshield in the back seat. <laughs> they were, boy, I, boy, you talking about fire coming out of my nostrils? How dare you? I was trying to speak to this bias. You can't do that. It was very different when it came to my, my father's 28 years my senior. And I remember the day when I finally had to say to him, Dad, you cannot refer to people like that. It's not right. I had to speak up and I had to speak out. My father used to call Mexican Mexicans. Say, why is that? Because they're messy. He hadn't been in no Mexican home. Something he heard somewhere. Chinese people were Chinamans or they were chinks or they were something else other than Chinese people. And you know, you know what they call the whites, right? Oh, you were spooks and spicks and ching. Y'all was everything, baby. Honkies and, oh, Lord, have mercy. But I had to come to a place where I was courageous enough to speak up and speak out against racial bias. And at some point, guess what? We have to do the same. I think God calls us to speak up and speak out, even if it's not popular. And then we have to aim to diversify uh, where we can. It says congregations. But uh, we, we need to learn to, to, to um, diversify in a variety of places, especially when, when we are in a diverse context. Now, most folks, if they were growing up in a, in a monocultural context, they say, well, we, well how, how, how do we do that? Well, we're the only ones here. Well, then you don't necessarily have to diversify, but hopefully you're learning about some other folk and you're preparing people that you know and engaging with people who are different from yourselves. Amen. Just a few ideas on how to deconstruct racial bias. Obviously, there's more that can be said, but we promise not to keep you here all night. But I think the sole purpose of tonight is to get us to wrestle with how identity is being formed and shaped and fashioned by what we see and what we hear. And look for points and places where that can be changed and look for ways that we can begin to deconstruct those things that do not honor God and are not reflective of the heart and the passion of God for other people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit here. Uh, we'll have time for some questions and answers, but I'm going to invite my sister, uh, Drea Chikas, back to the platform. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Harvey. Um, So let's seal the word of the Lord um, in our hearts. Um, I am going to read a prayer from the heart of racial justice, how soul change leads to social change. Um, It is a book written by Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil and Rick Richardson, and I believe that every one of us should have a copy of this book. Let's pray. God, Thank you that you made us in your image to fill the earth and to bring all things under your reign. Thank you that you have called us to be culture creators and have given us our ethnic backgrounds as a gift. We confess that we have misused this gift and rebelled against you through our ethnocentrism and pride. 
we ask your forgiveness for our part by ignorance, silence, or active participation in excluding and judging other people. Thank you that you have given all peoples as being made in your image the capacity to participate in your kingdom. Praise you, Lord, that my, our ethnic identity is a part of your good purpose and plan for our life and for the world. We look forward to the day when people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation will worship you together with all that we have and all that we are in the kingdom of God. Amen. So I will take a few minutes to share my story um, on how it relates to race and media. Um, shortly following, I will ask anyone who has a question to come forward and to use one of the microphones. So when we look at the media and stereotypes, as Pastor Harvey explained, um, Latinos are often portrayed as illegals, as maids, as gangsters, or cholos, or as fiery red lipstick hot mamas like Sofia Vergara from Modern Family. But for me, growing up as a first-generation U.S.-born Latina and the daughter of two hard-working immigrant parents, my life did not reflect these stereotypes. In just 10 years after they, they immigrated from El Salvador, not Mexico, my family achieved middle-class status in this country. My parents were married and had stable jobs, and as a result, we benefited from high quality education, health care. Our bellies were always full, and we did um, choose private schooling um, for my siblings and I. We also traveled to El Salvador during summer vacations and went camping all throughout California. And yet, despite the privilege of being born into economic stability, throughout my life, I've been assumed uneducated, incompetent, poor, and the product of el barrio, or the hood. Instead of a culturally rich, immigrant, middle-class, hardworking, and educated family. This is the power that stereotypes have had on my identity, and even on Latinos as a group of people. We're presumed as poor and uneducated first, until we prove otherwise. Now I'm gonna share a little bit about my story as it relates to education, and I always um, share a caveat, because if you wanna know the depth of my story, you gotta take me out to coffee. I love making friends, um, and this is just a fraction um, of my story as it relates to education. So when I was 14, I attended one of the most prestigious high schools in San Francisco. It was a predominantly white European American school. And just to give you an idea of the type of wealth um, of, of the students I went to school with, I attended school with the daughter of the family who owned Gap Inc. and the grandson of the scientist who invented the pill. The granddaughter um, of Neil Young, um, and so many other um, well-known people. So when I interacted with this type of wealth and power, I looked at my background and culture and believed that what I had to offer was meager. It wasn't good enough. And so even for a long time, I assumed that my parents um, immigrated to this country because they were poor in El Salvador. And so, in reality, my parents come from the, from the background of agrarian wealth, um, and they were very wealthy in land and cattle in El Salvador. Um, but the power, the poverty narrative of Central America and South America is so deeply ingrained um, in the psyche of U.S. American history that I believed that I came from a poor background and that my parents immigrated because they were poor. So even I believed the lies. But oftentimes, when I was in this school that was very rich and wealthy with all my peers, I also firmly stood on the rootedness 
of my culture. Let me tell you that I developed confidence in knowing where exactly my family immigrated from, that I spoke Spanish perfectly and got A's in all my Spanish class, um, a culture wealth that my white peers could not claim. But still, I never felt fully at ease in a white, wealthy, dominant construct. And so here is the tension that I lived and have lived um, with for a very long time. The result of attending such a prestigious private high school gave me access and status. I went on to a prestigious liberal arts um, college, Occidental College, um, and I've been close to systemic power that most of my siblings, my family, and my community will not see in their lifetime. Um, so I often dealt with guilt and shame because of that. And so I often reflect, what does it all mean that God would have me, um, you know, attend the best high school, one of the best um, colleges, and even go on to higher education and receive my graduate degree? Well, I believe that God will use this life, the life of a privileged young Latina woman, um, much like he used the life of Moses, who came, was adopted into a very privileged background, and then went back to guide the Egyptians to freedom. And so when I think about my story, right, and what I've shared with you today, I think about my friend, Cambry, who says that the one thing that we all have in common is and the one thing that nobody can argue is our story. We all have it. That's the one thing that equalizes us, right? Because I can never say your story's wrong. And so I would challenge you to look at who's in your network, who's in your group of friends, and do they know your story? Do they know your identity? Do they know um, where your people have immigrated from? Because we all have people that have immigrated to this country. Um, the only people who originally were here were the First Nations or Native Americans. Um, I challenge you to look around your dinner table. Who's eating dinner with you? Do they all look like you? Um, and then I challenge you, when you look at Latinos, to not look at us as cholos or maids or fiery, beautiful women, even though most of us are, um, <laughs> but to really um, take the, or be courageous to ask us our story um, and to sit down and eat a meal together just as Christ the Father did. Thank you. So we are, we are entering our um, question portion of the evening. I would ask that you please keep your questions brief or under a minute. Um, you can address your questions to myself as the community voice or Pastor Harvey, um, and I will go ahead and invite you all to come forward. Uh, we'll get the mics to you. So you register, rather than uh, trying to get through the pews, we'll get the mics to you. So just raise your hand if you have a question. We'll get the mics to you. Hi, I'm Taylor. Um, I work at Seattle's Union Gospel Mission with uh, middle school and high schoolers. My question's for both of you, I guess. Um, so the, the teens I work with, specifically the boys, the things that they say about themselves and about their classmates, they're completely um, defined by stereotypes. And I know that a lot of that is from media and things that you're talking about. Um, so I guess specifically for um, Pastor Drake, I wonder how did you talk to your boys about that? Or um, what, are, what are things that we can do to talk to our youth about changing that cycle? Mm -hmm. okay. I, would, I would say for me, with my fellows, I tried to have the conversation through experiences. <clears throat> because uh, most of the guys you're probably working with are going to be defined and limited by their experiences. And so they, they, they have a stereotype they look into, they look at MTV, they look at whatever stations they look to, and they have certain images there. 
by getting them exposed to other things, it broadens their perspective and their horizons. And that's what I did with my fellas. I did everything I can. Even now, in the work that we do, we're constantly trying to look for ways to broaden their experience so that they can see that they can be other things and do other things. So as you're working with those young guys there in the, in the community, is that look for ways that you can expose them to something else. In fact, they called me crazy when I was in Oakland because I went to, I went to white churches, raise money for ski lessons and lift tickets. What are you doing taking those black kids to, to, to ski? They can't afford skiing. No, they couldn't, but I wanted them exposed to the cold <laughs> and I wanted them exposed to that, that sport. Because again, it was going to stretch them and change their, their, their idea of what they could or could not do. So that's what I would, that's how I did it with my sons is through experiences and that's what I try to do with others. If I have my way, I'm gonna, get, I'm, I'm gonna look for ways to take uh, young black men, not exclusively, but particularly to places like Haiti and El Salvador or other places, I should say, in Africa where they have more abject poverty so that they can see what a contrast looks like and so that they can understand that we have opportunities here that we're just blowing because we just take them for granted because we don't really know what poverty is on a global scope. And most of the poor folk here in America have far more than the poor people around the world. So it's about exposure and taking them to places where they don't have nearly as much as we do in material ways but they have so much more in spiritual ways and in terms of family and in terms of ethics and in terms of the way they live. So does that help at all? And I Drea? Would say, yeah, I would say, first of all, I work with young people um, and have for a really long time. And um, stereotypes are very normal. Them, them talking to each other uh, within the stereotypes um, that we mm -hmm. have even heard today is very normal, so understanding that first. When you look at the media and how much we're bombarded with stereotypes, mm -hmm. I mean, it's no wonder that they're <laughs> feeding back what they're receiving right through shows, music, and what have you. Um, but it's really taking the time to sit with them and kind of unpack what they say. Um, and when we create spaces for young people, safe spaces where they can speak their truth, and even you know, create spaces where they can honestly and candidly have these kinds of conversations, um, then they will, underneath their stereotypes, reveal truly what they believe. And it's important to, um, you know, create icebreakers or even educate ourselves as educators. What kind of activities can I do with my young people so that we can unpack some of these stereotypes that are happening? So have the courage to really um, unpack it with them. While, you, while you're thinking, I would ask you to consider what conversations do you find hardest to have as it relates to a race relations? Because I, I think we have to, if we're gonna, if we're gonna get beyond the divide that we have, there's gotta be much more conversation that we have. And uh, we have to be careful not to try and ignore some of the realities that we have. So if George and I get together, we can, we can have a fun time together and we can talk about skiing and about football and about basketball and our kids. My, my son lived in Europe for nine years and he just came home and I'm just so elated to have him back. You know, We can talk about that experience that he had and the fact that he speaks you know, fluent Swedish and uh, all night. It's, uh, can you imagine a Negro speaking Swedish? <laughs> But the reality is if we aren't careful, we will ignore some of the tougher conversations that we need to have that might get us to a place where we unpack our stories. Sometimes we're, we're afraid to even talk about or hear each other's stories. And I don't want white people who have been born in privilege to be ashamed of their privilege. I want people who have had privilege to figure out ways they can use that privilege to benefit people around them. Because let's, let's face it. You know, uh, when I went to South Africa and my African host couldn't get me into that hotel, guess who did? My white friends. And I was so grateful <laughs> because they used their privilege to get me a nice place to sleep, you know. So, so, so these conversations are real critical for us to have. Anybody else? <clears throat> so... Um 
Thank you. Thank you for being here. This, this has been an interesting conversation. And one of the things that you had on your, your list of things to, for us to try to do is diversify. You said diversify the con um, congregation. I, I think of so many organizations in Washington or in Seattle in particular that are, um, you know, they, they want to talk about social justice, but they're pretty much all white. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, well, how come they don't come and join us? So how, yeah, do you have ideas for a, a congregation like this that is still very much mm -hmm, predominantly mm -hmm, white mm -hmm. or other organizations that really want to have that meaningful engagement, how to even get those conversations started? Mm -hmm. you, you want to tackle that one first? Or? Well, I think okay. it was addressed to you. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> so. Really? Okay. <laughs> okay, so th this is how I think about it. Uh, we tend to be drawn to things that we can identify with, first of all. So if we want to diversify any context that we're in, I think we have to have in those places things that other people can identify with. Because naturally, we tend to have things that we identify with, very naturally. That's not bad. Okay? It just is, right? If you come to my house, you're probably going to hear more Marvin Gaye than you hear Neil Diamond. I'll just tell you the truth, all right? More Aretha Franklin. You know what I mean? Then uh, Carrie Underwood, all right? <laughs> but when you come to my house, you will hear some Carrie Underwood. When you come to my house, you're going to hear some Michael Buble. Because I'm hoping to create an environment by which you can connect with and identify with when you come. Now, I can force you to listen to the four tops all night if I want to. But I want to create an environment where people can see themselves and identify with something. And so in our congregations, uh, when, when we do things, when we speak, when we put up posters, when we put up photos, when we have music, what are we presenting that other people might connect with? Right? That becomes critical if you want other people to be there. Because some of us have grown, to, uh, grown in a way that we can, we, can, we can identify with most anything. I'm, I'm very musically eclectic. I grew up singing all my life. My wife is the same way. I like lots of different styles. I've got classical music. You know, I can't listen to it too long. But I listen to it and I enjoy it. You know, when I want to go to sleep, I don't put on rap. It's too, too bumpy, too noisy. I get some nice, easy listening music. Okay? And I say that because ultimately we have to create the environment that we think will be inviting to other people. And if we're in a mono, monolithic uh, cult, uh, context, again, when, when I want people in, what am I going to adjust to make that happen? And, and so it takes some, some work on our part, I think, to kind of help. Do, do you, you look like you have a comment, Drea? I was going to say that Dr. Keene said that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour mm -hmm. um, in the U.S. of A. And I think that there's a reason for that, because coming together um, as a body of Christ with our ethnicities, with our values, I mean, there's bound to be clashes. Um, and so, mm -hmm. so I think that avoiding it altogether is a lot easier. Um, but I believe that God is calling us into a new way of, of sharing life together because we don't come together as just spirits, even though we believe in the same God and the same Christ. We come with our outer appearance. We come with our skin color. We come with our values. We come with our family, representing a family system. And so part of the messiness of that, part of the beauty of that is you know, coming together and it's not always going to be pretty. But I believe that, you know, if we, that God wants to meet us where we are and we, if we invite him in the process that ultimately it's going to be through him that the work is going to be accomplished. So, but we got to, we got to make that commitment in our hearts. And so if you remember Pharaoh, it wasn't until his heart changed um, that things in the physical realm changed. I was reminded of I, I, the church I lead is about is 40 percent African American, 40 percent white. The other 20 percent would be East Indian, Chamorro, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Filipino, Samoan, etc. And uh, when we first started, people people asked, uh, um, do, "Do you all clap on two, four, or one, three? <laughs> and, and to be honest with you, it was a constant applause all the time. 
because you had those who were on one three, one of those are two four, and it was just, oh my goodness. But we had to bear that. We had to be comfortable with the uncomfortable in order to get where God wants us. And, and as a leader in my congregation, uh, I stress with our music team, our worship leaders, that um, we, we have to have a balance in the music that we present in our congregation. I don't want all black Sunday. I don't want all white Sunday. I don't want all brown Sunday. I want when people come, I want them to be able to connect with the word of God and the power of God in a way that they connect best. And so, so when they when they come up with their song list, they have to work at making sure they have a balance. Now they gotta stomp some now, you know. I gotta get my stomp in there, right? But then some people just love to be quiet and worship. Oh my you know, and we have to have both in. So after I get loud, you know, with the people and get to shouting a little bit, then I have to say, okay, let's just be still before God. <laughs> and it's hard for some people to be still. You know what I mean? And we have to realize that worship services are designed to be done together, not in isolation. And a lot of our worship services are people in the same space, but by themselves. Rarely if ever look at each other, don't talk to each other, and God forbid we we put our arms around each other in church. Come here, bro. <laughs> and God forbid I pull him out here and try to get him to do a little dance. Oh, yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? That's where he wants to draw the line. See, he's always trying to control things, baby. Come on out and dance with me. But it's again, again, we're we're trying to figure out ways to create an environment where people can can be comfortable and enjoy the presence of God. And we grow to appreciate each other's style. Amen? That's the one thing I love about America. Where else can you go where you can have Thai food one day, Mexican food the other day? Uh, I love pupusas, by the way. Amen. Ooh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> you got to show me where they are in Seattle. All right? Um, um, and where else can you go and get filet mignon? If you just, just, just want a hot dog, go to Costco. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? They give you a real hot dog for a real price. If you go to the movie theater, it makes me mad. I say, you mean I only get one of these for $4? Seven. Oh, is it seven? Oh, see, that's why I don't buy in there. I sneak by in from Costco. No, I'm just, just kidding, just kidding. But, but, but we, we live in a place where we have this abundance of variety. And it's about becoming comfortable with enjoying other things other cultures, other places. And it's, it's just a w wonderful thing, man. So I think there's another question over here somewhere, right? Or is it here? So when, when the national attention focuses on an event, and the news media. Say that a little bit. The national attention when, does what? Uh, when, when the national news media focuses on an event. Okay. And everything gets escalated. And everything turns into a, a news circus. Um, how can a Christian, amidst all of that, bring it back down and have a, a meaningful conversation? Mm -hmm. and, and what is the meaningful conversation to be had? Uh huh. Uh huh. Hmm. Let, let me tell you what I did recently. Uh, I was a part of a march that went from 23rd and Union down to the uh, uh, federal court courthouse. Drea was a part of that march and a few others from our, our organization. And on the way down, they said, Pastor, we want you to have words. I go, what, what? See, you should have told me a week ago so I could have prepared something that you'll be listening 50 years from now, right? Uh, so I got down there anyway. And, and unfortunately, all, you know, people were obviously very emotional about what happened at Ferguson. And... Um, Mike Brown, and so people were angry with the police and angry with the system and this, that, and the other. And when I got up, I, I kept saying, God, what should I say? And when I got up, I asked people to look around. I said, I want you to look at the person on your left and right. I said, now look at the person behind you. Now run. Uh, and I said, and what I want you to do is this. I want you, I want you to change how you view that person. I want you to realize that the person you just looked at is somebody who has been created in the image and likeness of God. So the problem with our current system is that we don't value each other highly anymore. And so it's easy to hurt each other because we don't see the value in each other. And so for me, it was about changing the conversation. 
moving it to a whole nother level. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm mad at, at injustice. I'm mad at, you know, bias. I'm mad at all these things. But I'm saying as a believer, do, do I just buy into what's being fed to us and what, f- what feeds the frenzy and what, what placates the media? Or do we begin to change the conversation so that it makes much more sense and so that we can move the conversation forward or to another place? So that's what I tried to do that day. I tried to say, listen, man, the the day that we start valuing each other, the day this killing would stop. I I won't see you as a monster, somebody to be afraid of, okay? Uh, He he looked, looked, you know, no, no, no. If I see you as somebody who literally is is, is made in the image and likeness of God, it's going to change how I interact with you. When I was uh, in junior high school, Dr. Martin Luther King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. I was in either eighth or ninth grade. It was 1968, right? <clears throat> and I can remember being so angry. And I went to school the next day. And I'm not saying this to brag. I have lamented this for years. But I went to school the next day and I beat and kicked and spat on every little white boy I came in contact with. We didn't do anything to the girls, but we, we kicked boys down the stairs. We threw them against walls. We knocked them on the floor because we were just so doggone angry. And every time I would hit one, I would say, this is for what your friend did to my friend. Because it was told on the news that a white guy killed the Reverend Do- Dr. Martin Luther King, right? Our hero, right? So I was just angry. That was before I knew Christ. Had I known Christ... At that point, my reaction should have been differently. Because I would have realized that in God's economy, every one of us has been created in the image and the likeness of God. And so now as an adult, now since I've been in Christ, when I encounter the same kind of situations, my response invariably has to be different because God makes the difference in us. And so I know it's a lot easy. It's easier to mishurt, than to do harm to each other and mistreat each other when we don't see each other the way God sees us. So I think at some point, brother, we've got to, we, we've got to change the conversation to uh, shift it in a way that we begin to get to the root causes. That, that, that what we see is the surface, right? That what's the root cause? It's how I, it, he, the guy kept telling him, he looked like a monster to me. What do you mean? That, that's another human being. What do you mean a monster? No, that's a friend. All right, when we were kids, we fought. We met at the bottom of the hill in my neighborhood, and we got up and played stickball. We didn't kill each other. We weren't stabbing each other. We weren't cutting each other. We weren't shooting each other because we were, we were community. We were family then. How do we regain some of that? I think if we do some of that, we, we will change the dialogue, and even at a national level, somebody's got to have enough courage to, to redirect some things and, and, and do some things that's out of the norm. But unless, unless we see it the way God sees it and try to apply it, eh, it's not going to happen, man. We'll, we'll, just let, we'll be led by our politics. We'll be led by our emotions. huh? We'll be led by some of our bad experiences. I cannot let my past experiences dictate what I do today. And if we are careful, that's what we do all the time. So, does that make sense at all? Right here, there's a there's a question right here. I think we're. Uh, this is a question about the priority of racial reconciliation mm-hmm. amongst all the other problems mm-hmm. in the world. Uh, and it's can, uh, do you think the church can change its racial cultural reality if racial reconciliation is not our number one priority? Hmm. Did, did everybody catch that question? Whew, wow. All the questions have been pretty, pretty dynamic. That one's hitting me real hard. <clears throat> can we really change our reality without making it a priority? What do you think? Well, specifically, my question was, does it need to be our number one priority if the reality is going to change? Mm-hmm. Or can it be number three? Mm. What, depends on what one and two are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if number one is still trying to amass as much materialism as we can, then no, three won't do. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
So really, but but I think my, your point, which I'm grabbing, is that for for the church it should be a priority because when Jesus left the earth, he prayed for his disciples that we would be one as he and the Father were one. And the priority is because he said, if you read that text a little slower, it says in John 17 that we are to be one as they are one so that the world might believe and so that the world might know. So ultimately, us getting along down here is really not just about us, Pastor Henneman. It really is about God's accomplishing his mission in convincing people of who he really is. And when people see us working together across racial lines and staying at the table even when we disagree with one another and being civil to one another, they're going to have to take notice because that just doesn't happen. The reason the world tries to ignore the problem is because they don't think there's any real solution to the problem. So the, the way we deal with things we don't have solutions for is we ignore them. If we ever think we can solve it, we put lots of money into it. We put a lot of money into curing cancer, a lot of money to get to the moon because, oh, we can do that. But when it comes to this matter, we don't think there's any real solution. And outside of Christ, I would, I, would, I would submit to you that there is no real solution. We cannot solve this problem in our own humanness. That's why we still have the problem now. But again, it has to, I think it has to be a priority for us to reflect the, the, the passion and the priorities of God. Is this a priority of God? That we begin to uh, love each other the way that he loves us. That we really treat each other as neighbors the way we would treat ourselves. Is this a priority for God? If it's a priority for God, then perhaps. So we have, I think there's one more question, and that'll be the last one. <clears throat> uh, so I don't necessarily know uh, what I exactly want to ask, but, um, so it's going to go on. But um, I, I'm, I'm kind of more like a, a Tiger Woods in, in my own respects, just kind of that last group of people, kind of mm -hmm. multi-ethnic, if you will. But um, I guess I'm, I, I guess I just wonder as, as to my, as I'm raising my children, yes, and even some of the struggles I personally went through, like figuring out who I am and what I have to contribute, I, I guess I'm just wondering what role do my children play in, you know, in this mm in our current culture as these, uh, in maybe the way I dealt with it was just not really emphasize any of my mm -hmm. cultures mm -hmm. or my ethnicities and just mm -hmm. blend in, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so, and now they're even, even more removed. They're like yeah. quarters of whatever I was. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking that question out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. We are a culture of copycats. And we tend to do what we see. Uh, and because of that, we, we will either have to set some new norms or encourage our children to set the new norms. But somebody's got to change the habits and the patterns. I almost feel sorry for people who are uh, uh, biracial, multicultural, because in this conversation, you usually get left out. We don't even think about you very much. And you get caught in, in, in the middle of everything. I mean, uh, <laughs> I remember doing a Bible study once on this stuff a few years back, and I asked a group if they would separate in two. I want all the whites over here and all the people of color on this side. And I was interested to see where the biracial people would go and how they identified. And I was like, oh, I said, did I just do that to my friends? And so they were going, okay, well, so which group do I sit with? Do I sit on my mother's side or my father's side? And, and, and it's, a, it's a tough place to be. And at some point, we're going to have some conversations where you all are up front leading to help us understand what your dynamic is as people who are multicultural. Right? But I think, when you, but your question goes back to... Um, what role will your children have? I, I, th I think it's really going to depend on, on how we lead them and encourage them as we move forward. I, I hope that my son will deal with some things very differently than I did. And hopefully they'll learn from the positive things that I did and also from some of the negative things that I did so that we have a much better outcome. I think I saw one hand here and then we'll, we have to, we have to this will be the, the last one right here. 
I'm just, hi, I'm just wondering if you're finding that as you work with people on this issue of racial, racial equality and all mm -hmm. that, and as you see progress and growth and transformation in relationships, you mm -hmm. know, and all that, does it also transfer over to other tragedies that are going on, you know, daily in our, in our societies, in families? I mean, real, real tragedies of, of, of dysfunction to the point of mm -hmm. eating, of, of just abuse and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It seems to me you make progress in one most important area like this. Yeah. It just, it's easier yeah. than to, be, to see it, that that's the way it ought to be in all these other situations yeah. that are just, yeah. you know, so tragic. Yeah. You're speaking to a multiple, is there a multiplying factor? In, in the process, if you make uh, progress in one area, is is there any potential for spillover to others? I, I would hope so. Can't say emphatically right now. I'd have to really cogitate on that a bit more. Well, uh, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I will close this out, um, but as we come to a close, uh, we want to draw your attention to Urban Impacts Table, where you can find more information or talk to someone about dialoguing more about this topic, so please stop by. Um, there will be some information about our prayer march, um, which we're really calling out to the body of believers to say, come march with us, let's reclaim our streets um, for Christ, and let's really call for peace um, in the south end of Seattle. Um, and we'll also continue these series for the next two Wednesdays, um, highlighting class and economics on Wednesday, January 21st, and on Wednesday, January 28th, um, the theme will be racial reconciliation in the church. Um, and so I just want to address um, the gentleman in the back, especially with the little ones. Um, one of my, um, my friends, who's a barber and also a reverend down in the south end of Seattle, says, the most important thing we have to inculcate in our children is for them to know who they are and whose they are. And that's really something that we continue to, um, as human beings, um, ask ourselves, even as adults, um, who we are and whose we are. And one of the things that I love about our God is that he really cares about the ordinary activity um, of his children, especially our ethnic identity and identities. Um, so I just want to leave you all with that, that our God really cares, and he does everything for a purpose um, and for his purpose. And so as we close, I would like to also um, read another prayer from the heart of racial justice, how soul change leads to social change. So let's pray. Dear God, make us new. Bring your spirit and your joy into all all our partnerships with one another so that we will no longer limp along in our relationships as prisoners to our past. We confess that we are a new creation, victim and perpetrator, sinner and sinned against, filled by the Holy Spirit for the remaking of the world into your kingdom. That kingdom will be built in the end by your power, but bring us into collaboration with you. We want to taste and see that the Lord is good and that his multi-ethnic kingdom of justice and love has been inaugurated. In the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>